Next presenter is going to be uh, Henry Canap. Henry is the uh, management consulting uh, practice leader for Mutt McDonald. Please welcome Henry Canap. So you come to Orlando so you can uh, learn about cost accounting. So uh, that's what we're going to talk about a little bit this morning. As, uh, as Angel indicated, this uh, done a number of NCHRP projects. I'm involved in three currently. Uh, this one is one of the projects we finished uh, roughly a year or so ago. Normally we would have covered this. The, uh, uh, this was a project, like I said, was finished a couple of years ago and normally would have been covered in a conference last year. And of course we all know what happened there. So uh, without any ado, I will tell you that this deck is unmodified or just minimally modified from what's available on the project website so that uh, you can download this if you go to the NCHRP uh, uh, research uh, website and look in for 1307 project. The report is available and so is this presentation. And I'm saying that as a way of trying to excuse right up front that there's a lot of text on these slides. Really this presentation was a deliverable for this project and it was intended to be more or less a cheat sheet to trying to figure out how to do this kind of cost accounting stuff within a fleet environment, and it's really targeted towards you folks. I mean, there was no shortage of materials from uh, various fleet publications, accounting publications, et cetera, but nothing was really tailored for the DOT fleet manager, and that's what this project was about, was coming up with something that would be directed to you folks' needs. So hopefully this is, um, uh, we're, you know, we're really interested in seeing you folks implement this stuff, and. And I will tell you, I'm, I'm actually involved in a couple of projects now that where we're doing fleet system implementations at state DOTs, and that is the absolute best opportunity you will ever have to try to implement this guidance, because there's where you actually have an opportunity to figure out how you want to hook up with your other accounting systems and try to bring costs back and forth, and you'll never have a better opportunity than you do when you're implementing these systems. So that's just sort of a... Those of you who are involved in that process, I know Jeff in West Virginia, Jim in South Carolina, starting Tim's in the middle of one in, in Kansas. This is really this is really good information. I encourage you to take advantage of it. As I indicated, this uh, the project objective here. Uh, I think I've more or less covered. It was essentially to divide, uh, provide a guide for DOT fleet managers. I mean, you guys, uh, there are lots of fleets. A lot of companies operate fleets. A lot of municipal fleets. But the long and short of it, the fact you guys are in a multi-location statewide operation makes you a little different and, and frankly within the state accounting systems can make it a real challenge to really come up with good fleet data. So that's what this project was really about. And I'm not going to try to read all the text on all of these slides because that would just bore you guys and, and, and I probably couldn't half see it anyway. So <laughs> in any event, we, you know, there's a, there's a process involved here and we're going to walk through it in some of this slide deck. And again, I, this, is not a, uh, this is not a 300 page document. The entire document is I think 60 pages, which includes a number of appendices. So this is really about a 30 page project to read through. And it's, so it's very approachable. And this deck is a pretty good shorthand way to do it. I do want to uh, acknowledge that the uh, prime contractor for this project was the Cadmus Group. Uh, and um, as you indicate, see on this slide, uh, Jeff Morrison was the uh, was the PI on this project, and uh, uh, Andy Burnham with uh, uh, Argonne Labs and myself were the uh, primary authors of a lot of the information. Do have several folks I think still are here today. I, I don't uh, don't spot everyone, but I know like uh, John uh, White from South Carolina, the previous fleet manager in South Carolina, and. Danny Keene, Melissa Boyer, and Tim Cunningham were all involved in this project, and some of these other folks I may have not uh, spotted in the audience, but we had a great panel, I and mean, this was a good project, and we were, I feel like we got a good product out of this thing. This guide is written, and it's intended to meet, uh, essentially target any audience that might be interested in this topic. One of the real challenges for you guys in lots of cases, and I'll go back to those of you who were in the meeting yesterday. You remember um, George Connor talking about that if you haven't already, at some point you will be challenged about why are we do we have a fleet? Why are we in the fleet business? Why isn't the fleet privatized? Well, at some level or another, answering those kind of questions all boils down to being able to, to show that you're being cost effective and efficient. And really, 
having a methodology that you're employing in, in accounting for the cost in your fleet really allows you to answer those questions. And frankly, you know, if there's an old fleet management adage or old management adage, you manage what you measure. And measuring at some level or another starts with costs. So that's, in a nutshell, that's the whole reason for this project. And really this guide is intended to help you, give you the tools or at least help you deliver the messages you need to, to in order to A, understand if your fleet is cost effective and be able to defend the cost that you're showing to folks uh, both internally and externally. Because this will happen to you at some point in time. Every fleet I've ever been a uh, around, especially in this, somebody is going to go to a, their legislature or a lobbyist or something and say, these guys shouldn't be in this business. So you really need to have your ducks in a row and you really need to have good, good information in order to base your decisions. So with that in mind, I'm just going to, we'll start walking through the document a little bit. And as I indicated, there's a lot of text on these slides because I didn't want to modify it too much from what was actually out on the website. So with that in mind, uh, this is not an eye test. But uh, there will be a lot of uh, text on these slides. I think this is a great slide. Uh, this one, uh, we, we, it, the, I think most of us think of accounting as, uh, I don't know, is, is, is something that's highly prescribed and that there's a, you know, there is a way to do it. And the reality is there are ways to do it. And it's, it's really an art. Uh, there are guidelines, there are general rules, and this guidebook attempts to apply those rules. But the reality is, the cost accounting is about trying to use common sense to come up with factors to determine how you're how you're manage your business. It's an art and not a, a science. And uh, one of the one of the messages here, I don't know if Tim's still in the room, but uh, yeah, Tim's over in the corner. Tim uh, picked up one of my favorite expressions. I, I borrow it from him all the time. He says, "Is the juice worth the squeeze?" And that's really a question that comes to mind here with this accounting topic. You got to make sure that you're not spending more time and more effort and more money to try to measure things at such a small level that it exceeds the amount of benefits you're getting out of it. And that's really a hard thing in your world to figure out. How much time and effort do I want to try to get down to measuring the cost of this bolt? Is it, worth this, is it worth the effort? And that's part of the question we try to uh, uh, help you guys address in this guide. Fleet managers use this cost information in a lot of ways. I've got six of them listed here. This manual does not give you the answers to these questions. This man answer, or, uh, manual is about trying to help you organize costs in order to answer these questions. So this is a way of coming up with a defensible way of approaching how you you can uh, you control your costs or how you measure your costs so that when folks come around again you can you can manage what you measure you can defend your costs and they will stand up to external scrutiny so that's that's part and parcel of what this whole project is about so now we're going to get into the exciting stuff cost accounting so let's talk about this a little bit it's not as it's not nearly as uh, as tough as you think uh, I think the reality is there's a general approach that, again, I'm sort of trying to cover in this, this guide, and there, we've got some simplified examples we're going to walk through. But the long and the short of it is one of the messages we had in this project is that fleets typically organize their cost around activities. This is consistent with the whole idea of what's called activity-based cost accounting. So fleets typically are organizing their costs around how they provide their equipment. You know, how do you actually field it? How do you, or how do you purchase it and amortize those costs? How do you maintain it and repair those, uh, measure the maintenance and repair of that equipment? How do you provide parts to that to support your fleet? And how do you provide fuel? And you'll see those four categories come up in these examples again that I'll draw your attention to. But this is a good thing to me. This is, I call this buckets. This is your four big buckets that you typically want to organize your fleet costs around because guess what? These are the four things that people can easily argue that why are you, you know, what's your fuel cost? How, how do you know that we should be, why do we have fuel tanks? Why aren't we just buying it from stations? You need to be able to answer those questions 
And by organizing costs around these buckets, it gives you an idea of where, how cost efficient are you in these areas and gives you a way to benchmark yourself against not only your peers, but the private sector. And again, that's part and parcel of what this project's about. With that in mind, this, this guide really is about a process. We're not prescribing what you do. We're giving you a process that you can go through to do it. And, and this is the basic eight steps that we go through in, in the manual that sort of help you figure out how to, to perform this work. And I'm not gonna even take the time to read through these eight steps, but in essence, we're, we're, this is a stair-step approach to trying to tackle this problem. And in it's, it's very approachable once you get, sort of get your head into it. We think it's actually uh, pretty easy to do once you sort of get your head around it. And that's the reason we're going to use an example. And now this example is, would be a lot easier if I'd had time and uh, opportunity to print it 100 copies to give to the folks here so you could have walked through and flipped back and forth between these numbers. But we'll do the best we can to try to just focus on the, the items that you need to be paying attention to as we move forward. And this is really the focus of the rest of this whole presentation, this hypothetical fleet. Now this is, these, we, we simplified our fleet here just to, to make it easier for, to follow in this kind of context. And we know this is not the way any of you folks' fleet really looks like. But this hypothetical fleet we have, we've got 1,000 passenger vehicles, 4,000 half-ton trucks. We've got 10 sh shops spread out across five districts, one central fleet office, 40 mechanics, five parts people or groups of people that support the parts function and three managers. Now you notice the underlying section on the last line of this group, we've got four accountants that provide support to fleet activities. This is not all they do. They do lots of other things for other divisions, for other groups within the DOT. But the, the, the whole real challenge in this exercise is you'll see for, for fleets or for any people that use accounting, indirect costs are always the challenge. How do you allocate them? How much do you allocate? And how, on what basis do you try to allocate the indirect costs? The direct costs are always the easy thing to do. And that's, again, we're gonna walk through this stepwise and hopefully we can uh, make this fairly simple. Here's your eye test, first eye test for the day. So as you can see here, we've just got a list of costs. This is not unlike, I'm sure you're, you, you get to print out some accounting already. And we've got sort of the major cost categories. In the top part of this, this slide there where we're seeing direct costs, and I'm not real good with using these pointers, I can't half see the things. But uh, you got the direct costs at the top. Those are the ones that we're gonna try to organize. Then they're the easy pieces. We throw those into those four buckets that we're talking about. Our challenge is on these indirect costs in the bottom. These are costs that the fleet bears so how do you tie those costs back to those four activities that we were talking about? Because we got to re we really want to try to express our cost as accurately as possible. So that's what we're going to be focusing on in the next few slides. Now I'm going to point out two numbers to you. I want you to pay attention to. The first slide is we got direct costs up here at the top of uh, thirty million dollars. Okay, now th that number will reappear in some of these other slides. So let's just look for it when we come back to it, as will that whole idea of four activities. The other number I want you to focus on is this 20,000 or $20 million. That's your indirect cost that we're going to be talking about. And that's where, the, that's where this gets, that's where the art gets applied to this, this process. So as I indicated, direct costs are pretty easy. You sort of know what falls into each category rather, you know, fairly intuitively. The cost of providing your equipment, the, you know, the cost of inspecting that equipment, upfitting the equipment, purchases and registration, these costs are all part of your equipment provision costs. And see in this example, we've, we brought the same numbers from that previous slide over and you can see we're showing it a subtable in this case of providing this equipment. And this example is $21 million. The fuel cost, fuel's pretty straightforward. I mean, that's a, you know, it's a very straightforward initiative. We've got fuel costs of $2 million. So that's the direct cost of $2 million for fuel. So there's two of our four buckets that we've already gone through. M maintaining and repairing the equipment. Well, the maintenance of that equipment's your labor costs. So that's this, this number right here. If we got $5 million worth of labor costs, 
And then what about our parts? Well, we got our parts cost, the actual parts cost, the cost of acquiring those parts, your people who are doing it, and the parts themselves, as well as the, you know, the, just the other equipment. So in this case, we've got uh, 1.5 million associated with the parts provision, which brings us that, there's that $30 million that we saw on the uh, slide a minute ago. So this is our direct cost. We've taken that list of direct costs we've broken them into their four buckets. Okay, pretty easy so far. Like I say, these, the direct costs are pretty easy, they're intuitive. You know those, that, the, the challenge is always the indirect costs. That's the ones that are really a, a struggle for all of us to try to do. This is some of those, those, that list, that laundry list of costs I had on the slide a few minutes ago included these items accounting support, pension contributions, et cetera, et cetera. You see down the list. Hopefully this looks pretty familiar to you because you, I'm sure you're seeing it in your costs already in some fashion or another. So how do you allocate those costs to those activities? There's a variety of approaches and practices that you can use. What we've included here is some of the more typical ones that are used by fleets to try to take those indirect costs that generally are sort of spread like mayonnaise. I always use that analogy. They spread like mayonnaise across the organization. You're trying to get your hands around them so you really understand in those activities how much should each activity bear. A good way to do that is we, you see in this right-hand section of the slide, we've got some of the typical ways you try to figure this stuff out. Accounting support, what fraction of the accounting hours do the people do and for what activity? Again, that activity word, as you see, it's on every single line of this. This is all about tying these activities, those four buckets, and bringing these indirect costs to apply to those activities. And I'm, I'm, again, I'm not going to try to go through this line item by line item, but you can see some typical ways that you can try. To, it's just approaches. There's, again, this is an art. And I see Tim nodding his head. He can understand it because we've gone through this. This is an art. It's not a science. We're not telling you this is how you have to do it. This is just a way to, have to do it, and it's a way that's really fairly commonly accepted. So in a nutshell, as you'll see through the next couple few slides, that we walk through this exercise of applying some of these costs in a fairly simplistic manner. And I'll, uh, again, I'm, we're, this is for the purposes of presentation. I'm up here for a few minutes, and then you go on to the next folks. So I realize you can't begin to grasp a lot of this stuff, but hopefully by hitting some of the high spots and, and uh, generally prescribing it in an outline fashion, you'll sort of grab some of the concepts. So in this particular slide, another, another eye test, we see we're looking at the uh, accounting costs on this thing here. So look up here. You're on this, again, we, we've got, here's our, you see these four categories? Do those look familiar? Fleet provision, maintenance and repair, fuel, and parts provision. So there's our four activities that we're trying to allocate cost to and what we've done is in this case we're looking at the accounting cost that was just one line item of those indirect costs that we're talking about so this example is walking through the the question of how do I allocate those accounting costs of those four activities well it's fairly simple it's a straightforward approach here how much time does each of these folks that are involved in this accounting function spend in each of these activities? So the question is, we know that not all their time is spent on fleet, period, just part of their time. So how much of it is allocated to fleet? How much is of it is allocated to other activities? And then within the fleets, how much is allocated to each activity? So if you look in this particular case, what we're seeing is that out of the $305,000 that these four accountants uh, cost the DOT in this, in this example, that roughly you got these percentages that are spent in the cost of providing the fleet, maintaining the fleet, providing fuel, and providing parts. What you see here is that the fleet activities only amount to $102,000 of the $305,000 that this account, these four accounting folks cost the DOT. So to over 200,000 of their costs are being absorbed by other activities outside the fleet. So in, a, in this activity-based cost accounting process, you're basically taking how much of their time are these folks spending and we're allocating their cost to those times. 
And that's sort of the basic process that we're doing. And down here in, like I say, in this second part of this slide, you can see the $28,000 for fleet provision is carried down to this idea where under the fleet provision line item, we got $28,000 of indirect costs that we're bringing down to this line. Now this example does not plow through, you know, step by step, but the process is the same. We got 28,000 that was supplied for the fleet under maintenance and repair. They would be that 32,000 that would be brought down to this line item. And we have the 29,000 that would be brought to fuel and this 11,000 that would be bought, brought to parts. So again, it's a, just this process, a very straightforward process. We figure out how much belongs to fleet, how much doesn't belong to fleet, and within the fleet function, how much belongs to each of these activities. And we continue to approach this thing through each of those laundry list of line items that we talked about, everything from, for, uh, you know, from, uh, from uniforms to you name it, uh, uh, for copying machines and, and telephone equipment. This is just a stepwise process that you go through to do that. Now, the way that you try to figure out how to, one of the ways we, you, you want to try to do this is there is a way to, how do you express this? How do you measure it? Typically in each of those four buckets that we're talking about, there's sort of a fairly standard way that you're looking at it. For equipment, especially again, you know, equipment, you're typically looking at it, you're measuring equipment. How much does it cost me a mile or how much does it cost me an hour to own this equipment and own and operate this equipment? On my maintenance and repair costs, that's typically expressed. How much is my labor cost per hour? How much per, per hour am I, is it costing me to maintain or for my technicians to work on equipment? And we're going to go through an example of, again, this is, there's more details on this. I'm not going to attempt to answer all these questions at this point. But the same for parts and the same for fuel. Again, just the four major categories, the major activities we talked about at the front, we're just going down this stepwise process. We're going down the pyramid and breaking this problem down into smaller and smaller pieces that are, are digestible that you can sort of chew on. In the case of equipment for provision, for instance, how do I allocate these indirect costs to my equipment? You know, I've, I've got, in this example, I, what did we, I don't even remember exactly how many faster equipment and how many uh, heavy equipment, but I've got to allocate these indirect costs across for the equipment provision to that equipment. How do I do it? On this slide, we're showing you three fairly common ways that this is done. And there's pros and cons to each. A unit-based cost driver would just simply say, I've got 5,000 pieces of equipment of all types. I'm just going to divide it every, this cost by 5,000 and every piece of equipment gets the same cost. That would be a unit-based cost driver. That's very easy to do, but as you see, according to this slide, uh, it puts a, tends to overburden low-cost equipment and underburden high-cost equipment. That's just the nature of it. I mean, if you're, if the, uh, you know, if, like I said, that's the problem with spreading it like mayonnaise. You get a, uh, uh, a five thousand dollar welder out there that is bearing the same burden as a uh, uh, half million dollar bridge snooper truck. So you know, so that that's there. Some cases that's okay. Some things it's not okay. Cost price driver, for instance, for like registration cost on your tagged equipment, costs you about the same amount of time and money to register a, a, an automobile as it does that bridge stupor truck. So for those kind of costs, that's fine. Another one is a percentage of direct cost, which is what I sort of implied in that discussion. If I got a half million dollar truck and I've got a $30,000 pickup, well, hey, I can just take how much money did I have, I can allocate it based on, well, these vehicles average this much cost, these vehicles average this much cost, so I'll after allocate that indirect cost on this basis. That works pretty good in lots of cases, especially where you're, like I say, you, you got costs that are fairly proportional to the amount of, uh, of uh, cost associated with that equipment. But like I say, even in that, re that same example I used where uh, a registration cost, well, you don't take you 10 times the effort to register a, a, a super truck as it does an automobile. So direct cost is, works for some things and it doesn't for other one. The last one we have limited here is something that was touched on actually yesterday very briefly is the concept of vehicle equivalencies. I'm not sure how many of you folks really dig into this on a regular basis, but it's just a shorthand method for taking into account the fact that it takes more labor 
to maintain your more complex equipment than it does your less complex equipment. So you use vehicle equivalencies, which historically were based on like a what amount of labor it takes you to maintain a standard automobile. A dump truck might be uh, 15 VEUs. Uh, you know, a, a uh, two and a half ton truck might be five, six VEUs. It's just another way of trying to allocate cost as vehicle equivalencies. That's another topic for another day to get into detail. But these are just three fairly common ways to tackle the allocation of indirect costs for the uh, for providing equipment. For the maintenance and repair provision activity that we're talking about, this is where we start getting into what I just basically, this is about determining what your shop rate is. This is a, really an important measure, and frankly, this is the one that I think for most fleets you get the most, uh, you, you get a lot of questions about your shop rate. But, and that's mostly because everybody goes to a car dealer at some point in time and has something done, and they can tell you right up front what it's going to cost based on their shop rate. So they've got a benchmark in mind, so that it's something people are used to. So it's really important that you have a shop rate, and, and it's important that you understand how to calculate it. And just in, again, this is, uh, that's, all, that's another presentation for another day. We could talk about developing a shop rate all day. I, I, I think it's a very important topic. But in a nutshell, you want to figure out how many hours your people have, per each of your technicians have, you want to figure out how much of it is actually productive because nobody can be productive. You know, they don't walk in and start pulling wrenches the second they walk in the door. And they don't, you know, they take vacations and they take other, and, uh, you know, have training and so on and so forth. So the long and the short of it, there's a whole methodology, again, that's covered. We cover it very briefly in this guide, but there's a whole guide that's devoted to that topic, essentially of trying to figure out how that you can measure your, uh, allocate your cost or, or measure your fleet and maintenance provision in a way that is comparable so that the time they're pulling, uh, your technicians are pulling wrenches are carrying all the costs for the times that they're not pulling wrenches. So I mean a good rule of thumb or at least in, in most of the fleets that I've been involved in working with the DOT world, if you've got technicians that are, bill, uh, are billing at 75 to 80 percent of their available time, they're doing a great job. You're really doing well because there's not many fleets that are hitting that number. That really means you've only got about six and or six and a ch change hours on a typical eight eight day or eight hour day that these guys can actually charge to a piece of equipment for maintaining it. All these other costs that we're talking about end up as costs that have to be borne by those direct costs. And again, I'm, I'm blowing through this at a very high rate. I, I know you folks are, almost everyone in this room is involved in this stuff, and I'm hoping you're, you're following along with me. But, but in a nutshell, the, the long and the short of it is that it's important that your shop rates be measured accurate because it is a very uh, common benchmark that you folks are being asked about. And if your rates just don't make sense to the people, you're going to get some questions. It's just going to start you you're down a whole path of trying to answer questions to people that they're going to get deeper and deeper into your business. So it's really good that you have a good handle on this. Fuel and parts are the easier, fairly easy ones. The typical way you're doing it on parts is you just look, how many parts did I sell last year? In this particular example, we're saying 1.5 million. How much did it cost me to support that parts function? Well, we said we got a million or a hundred thousand dollars worth of, of labor's cost. So, uh, uh, typically, parts are expressed as a terms of a markup. So, in this particular example, a fleet that, that sold 1.5 million dollars worth of parts and it cost them a hundred thousand dollars in uh, uh, the labor support and, and uh, indirect costs to do it, they're going to mark their parts up 6.67% in order to break even. If they don't mark our parts up 6.7%, they're not breaking even on their parts sales. If they mark it up more, they're over-recovering. If they mark it up less, they're under-recovering. In either case, if they're over or under-recovering, that represents a, a, mis a mis-subsidy. You're either subsidizing or one op activity in favor of another one when you don't allocate your costs accurately. And again, the fuel one I'll blow through even quicker because the long and short of it, in this case, you're just looking at how much did it cost me to support my fueling operations, how much fuel did I uh, burned last year. So typically your fuel costs are expressed in terms of a, a percentage markup or a fuel markup per gallon. It's typically, you know, cost per gallon. In this case, the example, 
200,000 of uh, direct fuel supported costs on a million gallons of fuel, 20 cents a gallon. I will make a quick comment. Some fleets like to use a percentage on fuel. As you can see right now, when you got highly volatile fuel costs where you're a percentage of fuel will will put you all over the map because you're you're over recovering and you're under recovering on a basis of a factor that you got very little control over if you use the actual units issue gallons that's a pretty it's sort of immune to some of that inflation concern and this is a again these are just good guidance for for this exercise of how to manage this cost accounting question some key considerations in this I repeat what I started with this is not a science, it's an art, despite the fact that there are uh, generally accepted rules and a lot of the stuff that we're talking, I've talked about are falls into this category of generally accepted rules, best practice for fleets. Uh, this guidance is very consistent with guidance you see in any number of cost accounting books that were used as reference as well as fleet uh, uh, top uh, so, uh, publications on this topic. Again, to my point of the art of it, always weigh precision against effort. That's this is a real challenge, especially for fleets that uh, um, you know that uh, the bigger your fleet, the more you can typically uh, and afford to try to get a little more precise. But if you're spending more money trying to check, uh, uh, chase that last dollar than you're trying to get benefit out of it, you're you're just adding. Uh, confusion without adding any really va real value. So this should be a high value exercise. That's the that's part of the message here. Make this a high value exercise where you're you're getting good uh, output for your input. As a rule of thumb, one of the hardest questions that fleet managers get asked is if I'm trying to allocate indirect costs, what call? Where do I stop? Do I does the chief engineer get part of? Do I have to charge part of the chief engineer's salary to my fleet? Do I have to charge the, you know, who all it's it? I think the general rule of thumb is if your fleet went away, what costs would go away? If those costs don't go away, then those aren't indirect costs that you should be bearing. Honestly, at least in my general rule of thumb, the fleet, think, take it this way. If the, free, if the fleet were outsourced, the fleet manager's job would still exist. He would simply be managing a contractor or a rental company or a leasing company rather than the fleet. So his costs, not all his costs should even be borne by the fleet. And his boss, none of that. In a rule of thumb, the fleet manager and below, I don't, I don't advocate trying to allocate costs above the fleet manager. Because again, those, they're, they're going to continue whether or not the fleet is uh, provided directly like you guys do or whether it was done through a vendor. But from starting with, it's all those other costs, the accounting costs, the, the maintenance costs, the copier costs, the telephone costs, the electrical costs. Those are the indirect costs that you really need to be focused on on this exercise. And again, this guidance, if you get into discussion with your accounting people or with your comptroller or whatever about, well, you guys should be bearing this cost, that cost, or the other cost. One of the purposes of this guide is this is a uh, you know we're still hoping that ASTO will uh, will actually uh, endorse this and guidance as as an official uh, product for the, for the ASTO folks, but long and short of it, this is a resource document that you can say, hey, listen, this was research done by the National Academies. This was highly researched. It's heavily supported. This is the guidance that we've been providing. So therefore, we feel like we're on solid ground when we say this is the way we think we should do this. So it gives you something, some way to push back in these areas. Another point on this point, and this is uh, fairly subtle, amortize all your equipment and make ready costs. What I'm meaning by this is those of you who deal with a lot of fleet data, and I know John and I talk about this, John Hildreth and I a lot, you get to analyzing fleet's data and it almost always you run into situations where a lot of their upfitting costs, uh, especially in that first year or so, end up showing as maintenance and repair costs. And they're not capitalizing. What it makes it look like, it makes it look like you're buying brand new equipment and it's costing you a ton of money to fix it in that first year. So you end up it, and it makes it, 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 it makes your maintenance and repair costs overstate some. And it really screws up a lot of your analysis. Everything it took to get that truck ready to go into service, from decals to lights to all that, ideally, 
that should be capitalized and as part of that whole equipment provision cost should be spread out as part of the cost over the life of that equipment. It shouldn't be born in that first year. And I know uh, some of the folks that I've worked with in here that have had, had this, have, we've run into this issue. You end up basically discarding your first year or sometimes even your first and second year's fleet costs because they make no sense. So this is a good thing when you're doing this kind of exercise to try to improve your cost accounting so you understand the cost of your operations and do that. That's a really good thing. Segregate accident and repair costs. This is the, one of the hardest things for fleets to seem to do, but you know, it's not the fleets, it's not the vehicle's fault if somebody runs it in a ditch. And if the cost of repairing that repair, uh, cost of a ditch shows up in that maintenance, it looks like that cost is, that vehicle's an expensive piece of equipment to operate. Well, it was because the operator ran it off into a ditch. So try to segregate those costs because it really gives you a bad, it gives you bad information to make management decisions. That's again part of this whole uh, message from this exercise. And then uh, the last thing here is, not uh, some fleets do a better job at this than others. Not any one of it I've ever really seen. Try to create standards for how you collect and enter these costs. The oldest message in the world is garbage in, garbage out when it comes to uh, uh, data of any kind. And in the fleet world, it's the same thing. I know a lot, most of the fleet projects I work on, I spend more time trying to filter out those outliers, the garbage data, than I do really in the analysis because if you don't, you really get, it, it'll send you off in a bad direction. And that's, this whole cost exercise is about trying to have better information so you can make better decisions. And with that in mind, I'll catch my breath and see if anyone has any questions here. A lot of information in a short period of time, but uh, thank you for bearing with me. Questions? Equipment management systems, you know, that's something that we need to feed with some of these data. Could there be a way to actually anticipate and prepare yourself to actually load the equipment management system in a way that actually helps you, you know, calculate those numbers? I think so, absolutely. You really need, you know, the, like I said, I think this was I've worked on several of this, these projects, Angel, and this is one, frankly, I think is more actionable and more what I'd call practice ready than something you folks should really be looking at. Because, yeah, if you want to do those things, if you don't have those plans in place up front, if you don't understand, here's where I am. It's hard to move from where, here's where I want to be. I yes. want to be able to measure the cost of equipment. And why can't I do that? Well, and, and, and I'm just using a rich, I'm actually using one of my clients right now without naming them. Well, I, I don't know what it costs. Uh, all my, uh, the maintenance uh, division is bearing all my fuel costs. I never see my fuel costs. They're in the maintenance division. They pay for the fuel. I don't see it in the fleet system. It's not even in my numbers. I can't look it up. I don't have any access to it. I don't even know how much unit, each unit is burning in fuel because it's paid for separately. You know, if it's your goal to understand that information, you've got to understand I've got to get it organized so that when you're ready to put that fleet system in, well, that's one of the questions the vendors are asking you. Well, where, where, the, where is this information residing? Well, my fuel sense information is over here in this counting system, and it's paid for by the maintenance forces, but I'd really like to have that information. Yes. So I know what, my, what kind of fuel usage I'm getting out of this equipment and what my operating costs are per hour. I know John and I were are working on a project right now where we're trying to figure out operating cost per hour, you'd be amazed. Almost no one has really got a good handle on what it's costing them per hour to operate their equipment. But yes, this is, that's, I just call that your homework, Angel. Yes, yes. if you could get a, you know, if you can take some of this information, get organized so that when your vendor's in there, then you know, here's the information we're looking for. Here's where it is. Can you help me? I want to be able to get that information. I want to be able to pull it into my fleet management system. So when I'm asking questions or answering questions about my fleet, I know where all the costs are, and it resides in a whole yes. bunch of different systems, and it's paid for by a whole bunch of different people. But I'm the fleet manager, and I want to be able to explain what our fleet is really taking to run. And not also that, also, you know, when they're asking you, you can actually run the report and not have to, you know, jump through hoops and go to different data sources to actually compile the information. You can just run a report and comment, and, you know. And the thing is also you got in-house costs for bulk fuel, and then you got external costs that, you know, should be fed into the fleet management system and, you know, all be in one source. 
that's the challenge to me in the DOT world. The challenge is what I explain is their costs are being paid for and collected all over the place. And very seldom does the fleet management system have all that data. So when you're getting a fleet management system, you have an opportunity. It's not that expensive up front for the vendor. The vendors have the capability of pulling it, that data out of these different systems. So you've got a one shop, uh, one stop shop in order to try to pull that information. If you don't, though, I can tell you, those of you who've worked with me in the past, I mean, you, I, you try to get this information together and you end up pulling these things out of a dozen different systems. And guess what? You can't run that report twice and never come up with the same numbers because you're pulling it from different systems. They got different cutoffs and the, uh, the reporting is just a mess. So if you take advantage of these opportunities when you're doing these systems to get all this stuff linked together, it is a tremendous opportunity for you to take advantage of. I hope that answered your question. Andrew. Yes, thank you. Well, I'm passionate about this subject, so if you, <laughs> <laughs> if you folks have, do have any questions, I'll be around uh, uh, the rest of the day and through tomorrow, and, and I think I know a whole, whole lot of you folks. I've been around this organization since uh, I told someone the other day before EMTSP. I was in Sacramento, California in the year 2000, and there's not a person in this room was here at that meeting at that time. I promise you. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you, Harry. The preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.